Gospel text this Sunday is taken from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6, verse 14 through 29. King Herod heard about it because Jesus' name had become well known. Some said John the Baptist has been raised from the dead, and that's why miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said he's Elijah. Still others said, he's a prophet like one of the prophets from long ago. When Herod heard of it, he said, John, the one I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had given orders to arrest John and to chain him in prison on account of Herod Dias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So Herod Dias held a grudge against him and wanted to kill him, but she could not. Because Herod feared for John and protected him, knowing he was a righteous and holy man. When Herod heard him, he would be very perplexed and yet he liked to listen to him. An opportune time came on his birthday when Herod gave a banquet for his nobles, military commanders, and the leading men of Galilee. When Herodias' own daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. The king said to the girl, ask me whatever you want and I'll give it to you. He promised her with an oath, whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half my kingdom. She went out, said to her mother, what should I ask for? John the Baptist head, she said. And once she hurried to the king, said, I want you to give me John the Baptist's head on a platter immediately. And although the king was deeply distressed because of his oaths and the guests, he did not want to refuse her. The king immediately sent for an executioner and commanded him to bring John's head. So he went and beheaded him in prison, brought his head on a platter, and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. And when John's disciples heard about it, they came and removed his corpse and placed it in a tomb. This, the great news of the Lord. Amen. Be seated. This is what I call a tale of two uh, loyalties. A tale of two loyalties. We as a community focus, and rightfully so, on faith. And we teach faith, and, and we're going to um, express our words of our faith using the Apostles' Creed. And faith, as we've studied, uh, at least in the he uh, Greek language, it comes from one Greek word. And we translate that one word into faith and believe and trust. But it's one word in the Greek, pisteo. And so we can say, I believe in this. In fact, when we read the scriptures, Jesus will say, what is the work that God requires of us? And his response is, believe in the one he has sent. Um, he could have easily said, trust in the one or have faith in the one. And sometimes they're translated like that. But there's one aspect that can, can elude us that's just as important, especially when we read the scriptures because it's part of the history of Israel and of Jesus' followers, and that is that of loyalty. When Israel was given the covenant at Mount Sinai through Moses, it was an agreement, the Ten Commandments. You will love the Lord your God and, and with all your heart, so summarizes it all. But that covenant expressed and embodied an arrangement based on loyalty. It's not that Israel no longer believed 
that there was a God that, Mos that spoke through Moses, they never abandoned that belief that it happened. But they did abandon loyalty to the covenant. And God had said back in Deuteronomy through Moses, there will come a time in which you will reject this covenant. You will reject me. You will not be loyal to me. And so God expresses this relationship with Israel by comparing it to a marriage. I'm the husband. You're the bride. Jesus does the same thing. I am the bride. The church is the groom. Paul uses the same language. The groom never has to believe that the bride exists, nor does the bride believe that the groom exists. That's taken for granted. But what is implied is loyalty. So faith embodies this aspect of loyalty that in Paul's understanding no longer applies to the covenant, the Sinai covenant, but now to the Messiah, to Jesus. Loyalty to him and him alone will fulfill the covenant that was given to Moses. Replace it, if you will. That's why when we have communion, we lift up the cup, and what does Jesus say? This cup is a new covenant, a new promise, loyalty to me as I am loyal to you. And as we look at this, you have this kind of loyalty that was embodied by John, the prophet. He was given a task by God, a unique task, and his loyalty was such that Jesus even remarked on it and said, nobody in the kingdom is greater than John. He is the greatest of all the men that have walked on the face of the earth. His loyalty is unmatched. And yet, he who's least in the kingdom is greater than John. Which makes you think. But he comments about John. What did you go out to see? A king? No. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. Because kings and people that have worldly power can fall into loyalty to the power structures that gave them that power. And so you have two men embodying two types of loyalty. John is loyal to the Messiah and to the God of the Messiah, above all. And Herod is loyal to the tradition that says, if a king makes an oath, he cannot break it, no matter what. That is a tradition. He may want to break it. He may reconsider and say, I made a very bad decision. But according to tradition and cultural norms, he cannot break it. This is the account of the book of Esther. The king realized he made a very bad decision in allowing the Jews to be executed on a certain day. And he can't take it back because the cultural norms won't allow him to. So what he does is he simply makes another edict and says, oh, and by the way, Jews, you can defend yourself. But he doesn't erase the law. So here you have two men with two different loyalties. And as you read through the Gospel of Mark, this text, Herod, he, he, it's, it's very conflicting for him. He doesn't want to do it, but he feels like he has to because the loyalty that he has expressed and the loyalty that has given him this position of power, he does not want to betray. And that is something that every single person that becomes a disciple of Christ has to deal with on a routine basis because we live in a world 
whose loyalty is not to the living God, but to the prince of this world, namely Satan, who is the one that gives power in this world by way of illusion and deceit. So here we have this, and this, this, this by, the, the, by the way, this dynamic of loyalty plays out through all of the Gospels. I'll give you a, an example. Remember Jesus going to the Samaritan woman? The Samaritan woman was a Samaritan, of course, and Samaritans and Jews have a very strong conflict between them. One is that the Jews believe that the proper place to worship is in Jerusalem because the temple is there. The Samaritans say, no, the proper place to worship is, mount, is on this mountain where Moses gave the blessings, and so our fathers worship here. Where do we go to worship? And his response is, believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship God neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. For God desires those who worship him in spirit and in truth. And that truth requires, demands, if you will, is in alignment with loyalty. Jesus' greatest resistance during his ministry were those people that had a deep, deep, deep loyalty to what they thought was God's will, but was actually a form of worship. So much so that they persecuted him. And that's the temptation that all of us have, is to veer our loyalty to rituals, customs, power, traditions, habits, etc., as compared to loyalty to Jesus the Messiah. It's a, it's a very enticing illusion because our loyalty is what determines our destiny. John demonstrated loyalty even to death. But he's not the only one. If you remember Peter and his loyalty, Peter even expressed it in front of everybody. I don't care if everybody deserts you. I will not leave you. I will die for you. That's loyalty. He just didn't realize he didn't have the fortitude to carry it out. It's not just Peter. Many examples run through scriptures of Jesus expressing loyalty. And one of those that is the most famous is Paul himself. When he says, I was so loyal to Judaism. I grew up in the church, if you will. I was the best student in all of the classes that I took. I observed every single ritual. I lit every candle. I did every annual observation. I adhered to the codes that were brought into what we can eat and what we couldn't eat. All this I was loyal to. But compared to knowing Christ, it isn't worth anything. And ultimately, loyalty is the difference between idolatry and true worship. Jesus remarks about this to the Pharisees of his time. He says, you know, you, go, you travel halfway across the world to make a convert to your denomination, which a Pharisee is a denomination. You had the Sadducees, you had the Zealots, you had the Pharisees, you had different denominations. You go halfway around the world to make this person a convert to your denomination, and he says, and this is so offensive, I think the reason why he said it this way is because it was like a slap in the face and it kind of woke him up. And you make them twice the son of hell as you. Whoa. He did not read how to win friends and influence people. 
but he's making a strong point. You're going and putting all this effort to bring people into loyalty, into a form of worship, when you are unable to teach them how to worship the true God in spirit and in truth. And when, going back to Peter, when you could see after Peter went through the disgrace that he experienced and the redemption and then the love that God bestowed upon him and saying, come in here, I knew, I knew what, I got you, you're good. On the day of Pentecost, Peter stands up and in loyalty to his Savior, speaks through the Spirit and thousands become converted. It's a great example. There are people that so desire, or there are people, I should say, that God so desires to reach with his spirit. And the world will constantly work to divert them into idolatry that masquerades as righteousness. Have you ever met somebody that's very loyal to a religious practice? It can become its own religion. And so, my friends in Christ, we gather today and we gather by the power of the Spirit to worship God in spirit and truth. We gather by His calling, the moving of His Spirit, to worship Him in ways that are going to be mysterious to us because God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. And when we fall into the idea that we think we pretty much know God's ways and his thoughts, we become susceptible to idolatry. And a loyalty not to the living God, but to something else that human beings have created. I don't think that at least in my lifetime, I will ever see any stained glass windows that have John the, he John the Baptist being beheaded. It's something we don't want to look at. It's something we don't want to have on display. It's something that is, well, quite, it's, it's brutal. It's gruesome. And yet it demonstrates the glory of God that allowed John to remain loyal to the very end and to step into the kingdom and receive his reward. John is, will not be the last one. And the question that I have to ask myself on a regular basis is, God, is there anything that I'm loyal to or placing my loyalty in that may not be of you? that may be my own creation, my own ritual, my own tradition that I find more comforting than your word itself. And you know, we're people, so we come up with those habits all the time. And as I was praying that, God gave me the answer today. I come in on a regular basis on a Sunday, try to get her early, and I have a prayer blank blanket, if you will, and I put it on the floor and I pray. And it's my ritual, and I like the ritual. And I get my cup of coffee, my Starbucks cup of coffee, and I come here and I check on the thermostats, and I go through the ritual, and then I pray or meditate. And as I was meditating, Lord, is there anything that I'm putting ahead of you? And as I did that, as I was on my prayer mat, I reached over for my cup of coffee and spilled the entire thing all over the blanket. The lid came off the whole cup of coffee. I could have got really angry. You're ruining my prayer time, God. Why did you allow this to happen? Instead, the Lord just made me laugh. Yeah, be careful that your own personal rituals, you don't worship over and above me. Coffee's good, rituals are beneficial, but I'm the prize. Don't lose sight. Let's pray. 
Lord, we thank you for your word, for your word gives us life. Nothing outside of your word gives us life. And while we are in this world waiting for your return, we will be tempted from time to time to look to certain things to give us comfort that can only come from you, to give us a sense of certainty and hope and life that can only come from you. And we pray that in your spirit, through your spirit, you guide us to avoid these things. Lead us not into temptation. But when we do, we ask for your forgiveness and learn the lesson and go on. And in so doing, may we become more and more empowered with your spirit and the freedom and the joy and the laughter and the forgiveness and the love that is found in your name. This we pray in the Savior's name who is with us now in the same way he was with his first disciples. Jesus, our Messiah. Amen.